Welcome back to another reading session at United Marxist Pact. This is Demon Sultan, as usual. We are reading the Investigation into Worker Organizations, going through our list of reading that I have put together, or rather, ask somebody to put together for me. We, last time, went through the manifesto or platform of the party left within the Italian Socialist Party, the preamble to the statutes of the Third Communist International, and the conditions of administration to it. This time, I am expecting to get through the theses on the Communist Party and the proletarian, uh, theses on the role of the Communist Party and the proletarian revolution, the theses on the national and colonial question, Potential the, the the 1920 theses on parliamentarism presented by Kai's absentitionist fraction of the ISP, and potentially the 1921 Italian Socialist Party, 17th Congress at Livorno, Constitution of the Kai's Party of Italy, section of the Third International's party program. I don't have strong hopes of getting to that but we will do our best for it. But as usual, I would like to do a quick recap of the readings that we did last time before getting into it. So let's get into that. In the 1920 manifesto or platform of the party left, this text explains the need for the development of a program utilizing the most advanced communists, the need to for, for full subordination to it lays out the expansion from class struggle to party development to goals being solidified under party analysis of conditions, the development of direction under the party's analysis, and then the development of the program, which encapsulates all of that. The Communist Party should bring all the most developed forces of the proletariat into itself and absorb all revolutionary energies. It should impress a new character and new direction to the class struggle of the proletariat because with the advent of a party, the basis for action changes. This new character and direction should produce methods for the achievement of the maximum objectives of communism. The objectives for the communists are 1. The violent struggle for the destruction of bourgeois power and 2. The production of the dictatorship of the proletariat as a regime of workers' councils. For emergent from these goals is the direction of the struggle, and emergent from the direction is a new program. The Communist Party, which have the most advanced understanding of the goals and direction, therefore, should produce the most advanced program. Therefore, anything that takes a position against this program must be excluded as it is backwards at best. This is the thought process going into it. This text calls for the following programmatic changes. 1. Homogenization of party statutes. The homogenized statutes must be structured around centralization and discipline. This is achieved through an, the implementation of systems. These systems include, for example, minimum weighing periods to join the party. So that we can determine if you're on the up and up and if you're actually interested. And two, periodical membership reviews so that we can determine whether or not you're actually doing your job and should remain in the party. Two, Enforcement of an obligation of all party members of discipline towards all tactical decisions of both the international and national congresses. This means that the national and international congresses must be in harmony, obviously, and it also means that fulfillment of discipline is the responsibility of the Central Committee. 3. Preparation for the inevitable decisive moment must be made. This includes... Diversity of tactics with the focus of legal work on propaganda. All propaganda must be brought under discipline and control by the central organs. Propagandization and creation of movements and organizations in all places wherein there is increased class-based oppression, such as among women, people of color, immigrants, youths, etc. Organize broad illegal work to create the conditions for direct class struggle. C. Provide all necessary material for such struggle, which would involve stockpiling of weaponry, organization and training of militia, and so on and so forth. 
4. Organize within all locations and structures where the working class are. Within them, create communist groups connected with the party. Use the propaganda of the party to produce propaganda. And then, uh, propaganda organ of the party, excuse me, or outlet of the party to produce propaganda and then take leadership position to utilizing that. Engage in entryism within all economic organizations and subordinate them to the Communist Party. Take over the cooperative movement's organization and expel the bourgeois and pay bourgeois influences from it. Also, five, participate within bourgeois elections, but solely with the following objectives. One, engage in revolutionary propaganda and agitation. And two, break up bourgeois organs of representative democracy. So, in other words, through democracy, make it so the bourgeois system is un unable to mobilize easily. Six, groups engaging with bourgeois electoral politics are suborned to the central committee and do not have the ability to present themselves as a separate body internally on issues involving general party politics. In other words, the party itself doesn't really directly engage in electoral politics. It is a... It is a group within the Communist Party which may involve itself in electoral politics and it gets no special rights or position or anything like that. And that was the uh, manifesto or platform of the yeah, party left within the Italian Socialist Party. Let's move on to the Third Congress International Second Congress. In the preamble to the statutes, in summary, it said that the party must organize on a social and international basis, not on a local, national, or economic one. It should be part of an international and be a mere individual section of the movement as a whole while remaining independent. All communist parties must reject chauvinism and bigotry of any kind and seek the emancipation of the workers of the whole world. All national communist parties that are part of the international should be able to obtain aid from the organized workers of other countries. And in addition, all member parties must be as firm and centralized as possible as an organization. So... What then are the conditions of admission to the Communist International? Well, I didn't list all of them. A lot of them were historically specific, but, or, a lot of them were historically specific. But let's talk about what it is that we can take from it, especially with, in terms of the fact that this was in re rejection of the Second International the opportunism that had gone in there. So, the analysis is as such. This text gives a program that all prospective members of the new international must follow, especially given the collapse and opportunism of the second international. Many of the requirements for specific formulations for national communist parties to adhere to in order to achieve membership. The Second International was filled to a brim with liquidationism and opportunism, and much of these demands emerge out of the struggle against social chauvinism and the like. Those joining the International must accept all aspects of the condition of admittance uh, as these are what fight against reformism, social pacifism, centrism, quote unquote, etc. So the list of conditions is as follows. 1. The party must engage in agitation propaganda. All propaganda must be fully in line with the communist program. The press organs must be run by reliable communists. Propaganda must be directly applicable and understandable by the working class. It must systematically attack all reformists, bourgeois influences, etc. within all the working, worker organizations. It must attack notions of social patriotism, chauvinism, social pacifism, etc. And it should show that these are mere phrases under bourge, any bourgeois state. Therefore, any calls for such ag are against the workers of the world are not but class collaborationist opportunism. 2. All parties must agitate in the military, illegally if necessary, to turn imperialist war into civil war. 
Three, all parties must agitate in rural areas among the proletariat, peasantry, and petite bourgeoisie. Four, all parties must methodically remove reformists and centrists from every responsible post, regardless of myths of the need for great skill or experience or so on in such positions. It should regularly undertake purges, redress, registration of membership in order to cleanse the party of backwards element. So these would be in party organizations, editorial boards, trade unions, parliamentary factions, co-ops, and anybody in local governments. Five, all parties must create the basis to make a legal action possible in preparation for when the bourgeoisie showed her true face. To do this, they should, one, liquidate liquidationists, and two, organize on the basis that they assume that the bourgeoisie will make legal action impossible. They just make the Communist Party illegal. Or they make engagement in trade unions illegal. Or they make talking about stuff in a Discord server illegal. <laughs> Ron DeSantis comes in and he says, all woke stuff is banned. <laughs> And uh, pressures YouTube to make it so people can't post woke content, which really just means anything that isn't far right <laughs> in these places. Continuing. Six. Any imperialist or colonialist country's communist party must... Recognize and reject entire the imperialism and colonialism of their national bourgeoisie. Support materially liberation movements in the colonies. Demand decolonization of their own nationals. Yeah. Demand decolonialism of their own nationals. That wasn't very closely in the... What is it called? MAGA communists or whatever. Gosh. Cultivate a fraternal bond between the working population in the colonies and their own. And propagandize the armies of their nation against imperialism and colonialism. And to turn, you know, imperialist war into civil war. Seven. The party must organize within all worker organizations and agitate towards communism. In that agitation, they must reject calls for quote-unquote left unity. Exposing the treachery of show chauvinists and centrists and the like. Kind cells within these organizations must be completely subordinated to the party as a whole. The party must create a union of unions and support union activity. The, this union must be international in character. This is actually illegal, by the way, in America. It, it was a major thing that they did in the Taft-Hartley Act. Eight, it must be built on the basis of democratic centralism. The party, through democratic centralism, must become as centralized as possible to maintain, centralized and organized as possible to maintain discipline within it, in the party center. It must be democratic to retain the confidence of party membership, and it must be endowed with the fullest rights, authority, and powers. And nine, all who reject the program are to be expelled from the party. With that said, it's time to move on to our new session, which is the Theses on the Role of the Communist Party in the Proletarian Revolution. This is still within the Second Congress of the Third Communist International. Let's get started. The international proletariat faces decisive struggles. The epoch in which we now live is the epoch of open civil war. The decisive hour is approaching. In almost every country in which there is a workers' movement of any importance, the working class faces a series of bitter struggles, arms in hand. More than ever because the working class requires strict organization. It must prepare itself untiringly for the struggle now, without wasting a single hour of valuable time. If the working class had possessed a disciplined communist party, even a small one, 
at the time of the Paris Commune of 1871, the first heroic uprising of the French proletariat would have been much more powerful and many mistakes and weaknesses could have been avoided. The struggles which the proletariat is now facing in a different historical situation will be far more fateful than those of 1871. The Second Congress of the Communist International therefore draws the attention of the revolutionary working class throughout the world to the following. 1. The Communist Party is in, is a part, or a fraction in the French tradition, of the working class, and moreover, it is the most advanced, most class conscious, and therefore its most revolutionary part. The Communist Party is created by the methods of natural selection of the best, the most con class conscious, the most self-sacrificing, and the most far-sighted workers. The Communist has no interests that differ from the interests of the whole working class. The Communist Party differs from the whole working class because it has an overall view of the whole historical road of the working class in its totality, because at every turn in this road it strives to defend not just the interests of a single group or single trade, but the interests of the working class in its totality. The Communist Party is the organizational and political lever with whose help the, the advanced part of the working class can steer the whole mass of the proletariat and the semi-proletariat onto the correct road. I'm suddenly reminded, you know, of all those people arguing, for example, baristas aren't real workers and stuff like that. It's like, Either you're just a moron or you're aiming at just removing the basis for any such, any any organization to organize on. Anyway, two. Until the time when state power has been conquered by the proletariat, and the proletariat has established its rule once and for all and secured from bourgeois restoration. Until that time, the Communist Party will have only a minority of the working class organized in its ranks. Until the seizure of power and during the period of transition, the Communist Party is able, under favorable conditions, to exercise undivided mental and political influence over all the proletarian and half-proletarian layers of the population, but is not able to unite them organizationally in its ranks. Only after the proletarian dictatorship has wrested out of the hands of bourgeoisie such powerful media of influence as the press, education, parliament, the church, the administrative machine, and so on. Only after the defeat of the bourgeois order has become clear for all to see. Only then will all or almost all workers start to enter the ranks of the Communist Party. Okay, so I actually want to start... Taking notes, so the Communist Party, Communist Party is made up of created through natural selection. Historical developments which confirm that party structure is the superior form. It steers the proletarian mass on to the correct road. Okay. The proletariat or the communist party will not be able to have the whole of society, uh, of the proletariat as its membership due to bourgeois hegemony. Of its membership during the 
struggle to take power. Is the bourgeois hegemony? It rejects left populism and acts as a guide on the historical road for the proletariat through taking the historically progressive stance. Give me some spacing. I just realized that my OBS pause button remains the enter key. I hoped I didn't lose a large amount. Let me go into settings real quick. Audio or hotkeys, excuse me. Apply. Well, this will be annoying if that is the case, but nothing to do with it now. Okay. One. The communist... Or actually, excuse me. The proletariat must have a party to engage in the most advanced class struggle. The class struggle is always aiming at eventual civil war so that political power can be achieved. The only way for purposeful seizure of power is to occur rather than an accidental spontaneous one is to have a political organization capable with with a with a um organized tested leadership well te technically not necessarily a leadership you're saying that the party must be a leadership. The organization being a an organized and tested leadership. Well, with clear aims tangible worked or developed program or measures taken nationally and internationally or policy. Okay, having, having such an organization starts or acts as the starting point for permanent communist construction.
under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Dun, dun, dun. The class struggle demands all worker organizations centralize and establish common leadership. Only the political class party can achieve this. Therefore, the determined minority of the working class communist wishes to act as a program wishes to organize the struggle of the masses is the communist party which can achieve the above no other organization or formless economic struggle can achieve can achieve Fine. I hate it. Same word being used. The same adjective being used for verb. Fuck. Right in a row. Okay. Back to the text. Six. The most important task of a truly communist party in always consists in always remaining in the closest contact with the broadest layers of the proletariat. In order to achieve this, the communists can and should work in those associations that are non-party, but nonetheless embrace big layers of the proletariat, such as, for example, the organization of war invalids in various countries, the hands-off Russia committees in Britain, proletarian tenants associations, etc. The Russian example of conf conferences of a so-called non-party workers and peasants is particularly important. Such conferences are organized in almost every town, in every workers' district, and also in the countryside. The broadest masses, even of the backward workers, take part in elections to these conferences. The most important current questions are placed on the agenda. The food question, the housing question, military questions, education, the political tasks of the day, etc. The communist influence on these non-party conferences mostly zealously and with these great success and with great success for the party the communists think that they're that one of their most important tasks is the work of organization and education within these broad workers organizations but precisely in order to organize this movement successfully to prevent the enemies of the revolutionary proletariat from taking over these broad workers movements the advanced communist workers must form their own independent closed communist party which always proceeds in an organized fashion and is able to perceive the general interests of communism at every turn of events and all forms of the movement okay i'm gonna take this and then We're going to do dot, dot, dot here. And then we're going to take this. Okay. Communist or V party must remain in close contact with the broadest 
layers of the proletariat. This is done through work in non-party worker associations. The party must organize such associations. It must educate within the associations. It must prevent the enemies of the revolutionary proletariat, e.g. populists, social democrats, bourgeoisie, has uh, rich peasantry, etc. from taking over these broad workers' movements. The party must form its own independent, closed, communist party, which, which always acts in an organized fashion and has their eye on the larger historical picture. Okay, back to text. Seven, communists by no means avoid non-party mass organizations of workers. Under certain conditions, they do not hold back from participating in them and even using them if they are in fact the reactionary character. Yellow unions, Christian unions, etc., I've never heard of Christian unions, but okay. The Communist Party constantly carries out its propaganda within these organizations and tirelessly convinces the workers that the idea of not joining a party on principle is consciously encouraged among the workers by the bourgeoisie and their assistance to divert the proletarians from the organized struggle for socialism. Okay. The party enters reactionary spaces in order to propagandize within them for their members to enter into proper uh, struggle. It seeks to convince reactionary workers that those trying to convince them not to join organized struggle Socialism are their class enemies. Back to text. Eight. The old classical division of the workers move into three forms the party, the trade unions, and the cooperatives has obviously been overtaken. The proletarian revolution in Russia has created the basic form of the proletarian dictatorship, the Soviets. The new division that we are everywhere encouraging is one, the party. Two, the Soviet. Three, the productive association, the trade union. So in other words, kick out the cooperatives and instead have worker council and trade union. 
But the workers' councils, too, as well as the pro revolutionary production associates, must constantly and systematically be led by the party of the proletariat, that is to say, by the Communist Party, the organized vanguard of the working class. The Communist Party, which must lead the struggle of the whole working class to the same extent in the economic and political, and also in the cultural field, must be the guiding spirit not only of the producers' association and of the workers' councils, but also in all other forms of proletarian organization. The rise of the Soviets as the basic historical form of the dictatorship by no means decreases the leading role of the Communist Party in the proletarian revolution. If the left communists of Germany uh, CF, their appeal to the German proletariat of April 9, 14, 1920, signed Communist Workers' Party of Germany, declare, quote, that the party too adapts more and more the ideas of Soviets and takes on a proletarian character. Then this is a f- confusing expression of the idea that the Communist Party must dissolve itself into Soviets and that the Soviets can replace the Communist Party. This idea is fundamentally false and reactionary. In the history of the Russian Revolution, we experienced a whole period in which the Soviets marched against the proletarian party and supported the policies and the agents of the bourgeoisie. The same thing could be observed in Germany. The same thing is also possible in other countries. On the contrary, the existence of a powerful communist party is necessary in order to enable the Soviets to do justice to to their historic tasks. A party that does not simply adapt itself to the Soviets, but is in a position to make them renounce adaptations of their own to the bourgeoisie and white guard social democracy. A party which, by means of the communist factions in the Soviets, is in a position to take the Soviets under the leadership of the communist party. Whoever suggests to the communist party that it should adapt to the Soviets, whoever sees the strength in of the parties proletarian character in such an adaptation is doing the party and the Soviets a kindly questionable favor and understands the significance neither of the Soviets nor of the party. The Soviet idea will be all the more sooner victorious. The stronger are the parties that we create in every country. Many independents and even right-wing socialists announce their support for the Soviet idea in words now. We will only be able to prevent these elements from distorting the Soviet idea if we have a strong Communist Party that is in a position to influence decisively the policies of the Soviets. Okay. So we're going to take this. And then we're going to Where, where is it? This bit here. Okay. One. The division of the workers movement is in three. The party, the worker councils, the trade unions. All right, let's just say the productive association. Worker councils must, or worker councils and productive associations must be constantly and systematically led by the party. The party must act as the economic, political, and cultural 
guide of the communist movement. It should be the guiding spirit of all actually. of all forms of proletarian organization. Soviets and productive associations are not necessarily looking long term overarching bleh, interests of the working class as a whole and 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 have in the past fought against it. The Communist Party is necessary to turn these organizations into revolutionary formations. Okay. Back to the text. Nine. The working class does not only need the Communist Party before and during the conquest of power, but also after the transfer of power into the hands of the working class. The history of the Communist Party of Russia, which has been in power for almost three years, shows the importance of the Communist Party does not diminish after the conquest of power by the working class. Excuse me. But on the contrary, grows extraordinarily. 10. On the day the working class conquers power, its party nevertheless remains before, as before, only a part of the working class. It's precisely that part of the working class that organized the victory. For two decades in Russia, and for a number of years in Germany, the Communist Party has carried out its fight not only against the bourgeoisie, but also against those socialists that are the bearers of the bourgeois influence in the working class. It took into its ranks the most steadfast, far-sighted, and advanced fighters in the working class. Only the existence of such a close organization of the elite of the working class makes it possible to overcome all the difficulties that place themselves in the path of the workers' dictatorship on the day following the victory. In the organization of a new proletarian Red Army, in the actual liquidation of the bourgeois state apparatus and its replacement by a nucleus of a new proletarian state apparatus, the fight against the craft tendencies of individual groups of workers, the fight against the local and regional patriotism, and in opening up paths to the creation of a new work discipline. In all these areas, the decisive word of the Communist Party belongs. Its members must fire and lead the majority of the working class by their own example. This is a good thing, but I don't think that it actually belongs into this investigation and it's it's the aftermath but at the same time it kind of tells us how it might need how it need to be organized right so that it would be able to transition to taking position i'll add it to i'll add it to our notes but we might not add it. We'll see. 11. The need for a political party of the proletariat will only disappear with the complete dissolution of the classes. On the way to the final victory of communism, it is possible that the historical significance of the three fundamental forms of proletarian organization of the present, party, Soviets, productive associations, will change, and that the uniform type of the workers' organization will gradualize, gradually crystallize out. 
The Communist Party will not, however, completely dissolve into the working class until communism has ceased to be an object of struggle, and the whole working class has become communist. Actually, you know, I'm going to take this. I know where I'm going to put it. We're going to put it in the dictatorship of the proletariat. Oops. Time. And and eleven. Okay. Well. The Second Congress of the Communist International not only confirms the historical tasks of the Communist Party in general, but tells the international proletariat, if only in general outline, what kind of Communist Party we require. 13. The Communist International is of the opinion that, particularly in the period of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the Communist Party must be built on the basis of an iron proletarian centralism. To lead the working class successfully in the long and hard civil wars that have broken out, the Communist Party must create an iron military order in its own ranks. The experience of the Communist Party ha led the working class after during three years of the Russian Civil War have shown that, without the strictest discipline, complete centralization, and full camaraderie confidence of all party organizations in the leading party center, the victory of the workers is impossible. I find it hilarious that people, you know, rail on the October Revolution and the and the transition. They're, they're, and they're like, oh, look how violent the seizure, the revolution was. And it's like, bro, like 200 people died in a near nationwide revolution at the end of a ridiculous bloody war that was world war one and then they ended world war one and then the 14 countries involved in world war one including the enemies of one another somehow found it in themselves to instantly swing in and combine their forces and collectively attack the nascent bolshevik state the the so-called war to end all wars was <laughs> not that <laughs> the bourgeoisie will fucking invade and do anything they can to stop any sort of development of a communist state because they recognize the threat it's it is a beacon to all workers of the world that it's possible to resist their power Continue. 14. The Communist Party must be built up on the basis of democratic centralism. The chief principle of democratic centralism is the election of the higher party cells by the lower, the unconditional and indispensable binding authority of all directives from the higher bodies to the lower, and the existence of a strong party center whose authority cannot be contested by anyone, are generally recognized for all leading party comrades in the period of one from one com party conference to another. Okay. Okay. So, democratic centralism. Party must be built on the principle of democratic centralism. Higher party cells are elected by lower by the lower cell. All higher bodies are unconditionally and 
can... Oh, I see. All directives from higher cells are unconditionally binding for lower cells. Strong party center with incontestable authority okay you know ultimately the communist party is in other words a military organization um and this can be a bit of a hard pill to swallow, but under the conditions that are forced upon us, this seems to be the only formulation of a party that's possible. Now, of course, in a in a traditional military, there is none of this democratic centralism. There's no electing your higher cells. It's all a very, very direct hierarchical system without any election hearing going on and there's tons of politicking in the background that you can't generally see yeah, and that politicking also you know goes into bourgeois uh parliaments and so on and so forth uh, with generals being eminently political entities as well as military ones So the question is, essentially, how is it that you can establish a highly militarized organization that retains the principles of proletarian organization? And the answer so far seems to have been democratic centralism. We'll see if that carries on into the future. Back to the text. 15. A series of communist parties in Europe and America have been forced to, as a result of the state of siege, declared against communists by the bourgeoisie to lead an illegal existence. It must be remembered that in such a state of affairs, one is from time to time obli obliged to abandon the strict observance of the principle of election and to permit the leading party institutions the right of co-option, as was the case in Russia on occasion. Under state of siege, the Communist Party is not able to use a democratic referendum to solve every serious question, but is rather forced to give its leading center the right, whenever necessary, to make important decisions which are binding on every party member. In other words, if your party is made illegal and the secret police are going in and arresting your members, you can't go in and have your members do meetings and public activities and go and give everybody a survey to see what they have to say <laughs> right you can't do that because then you'll be busted by the cops and your leadership taken so instead at that point you're you're if you're in a safe seat you're at war and your your center needs to take the lead, even if it isn't actually really be, being given democratic um, oversight. 16. The advocacy of widespread autonomy for individual local party branches can only weaken the ranks of the Communist Party, undermine its ability to act in favor of pay bourgeois, anarchist, and disruptive tendencies. We'll, we'll, we'll take this and we will say local groups need to be suborned to the party. 17. In the countries in which bourgeoisie or counter-revolutionary social democracy is still in power, the communist parties must learn to link the legal work with the legal in a planned manner. In the process, the legal work must constantly be under the con actual control of the illegal party. The Communist Parliamentary 
factions, not only in the central national, but also in local, regional, and local council. Institutions of the state must be subordinate to control of the whole party. Regardless of whether the whole party is legal or illegal at any given moment, those members of parliament who refuse in any shape or form to subordinate themselves to the party must be expelled from the ranks of the Communist Party. The legal press, newspapers, and publishing must be subordinated totally and unconditionally to the whole party and the central committee. Okay. Uh, insert row below. Let's see. Communist parties. Party. must link illegal work eh, illegal and legal work in a planned manner legal work must be under the actual control of the illegal party Communist parliamentary factions within the bourgeois state must be subordinate to the control of the whole party. Those who do not Except this subordination uh, are to be expelled. The propaganda outlet must be completely subordinate to the whole party and its central committee. That would be the central organ by, uh, I must be misremembering. Okay. 18. The basis of the organizational activity of the Communist Party must everywhere be the creation of a communist cell. However small the number of proletarians and semi-proletarians involved may be from time to time. In every Soviet, in every trade union, in every factory, in every cooperative society, in every residence committee, tenants association. Where there are even only three people who side with communism, a communist cell must be formed immediately. Only the unity of the communists give the vanguard of the proletariat the possibility of leaving the whole working class. All communist party cells that work in non-party organizations are unconditionally subordinated to the whole party organization completely irrespective of whether the party is working legally or illegally at that given moment the kind cells of every kind must be subordinated to one the, the one to the other in the strictly hierarchical order of rank according to the most precise system possible okay the The Communist Party must create cells of at least three communists in every single organization or worker organization. These cells must give information, engage in propaganda and agitation, and seek to bring the organization into the communist parties. Let me 
its cells are subordinate to the Communist Party. Okay. 19. The Communist Party arises almost everywhere as an urban party, as a party of industrial workers who for the main part live in towns. For the easiest and quickest possible victory of the working class it is necessary for the Communist Party to not only to become not only the party of towns, but also the party of the villages. The Communist must develop it party must develop its propaganda and organizational activity among rural workers and the small and middle peasants. The Communist Party must work with special care of the organization of communist cells in the con countryside. Insert row below. The Communist Party must create propaganda and organizations within rural areas. The international organization of the proletariat can only be strong if the views of the role of the Communist Party formulated above take root in every country in which communists live and fight. The Communist International has invited to its Congress every trade union that recognizes the principle of the Communist International it is prepared to break with the Yellow International. The Communist International will organize an international section of the trade unions standing on the form foundation of communism. The Communist International will not refuse to work with any non-party workers organization that wishes to carry out a serious revolutionary fight against the bourgeoisie. In the process, however, the Communist International will make the following points to proletarians of the whole world. 1. The Communist Party is the main and fundamental weapon for the liberation of the working class. In every country, we must not have just groups or currents, but a Communist Party. 2. In every country, there should exist only one single United Communist Party. 3. The Communist Party should be built up on the principle of the strictest centralization, and in the epoch of the Civil War, it should have military discipline reigning in its ranks. 4. Wherever there are only a dozen proletarians or semi-proletarians, the Communist Party must have an organized cell. 5. There must be in every non-party institution a communist cell which is strictly subordinate to the whole party. 6. Firmly and persistently defending the program and revolutionary tactics of communism. The par communist party must constantly be linked as closely as possible with the broad workers' organizations and avoid sectarian as much as lack of principles. And that is the whole of the text. I'm going to add this last little bit here. And that is the uh, United Marxist Pact reading and general anal analysis of the theses on the role of the Communist Party in the proletarian revolution within the Third Communist International. As usual, it is very raw, but eventually we will come back and we will put all of this together into one big thing. With that said, thanks for listening in, and we'll see you in the next video.